Shannon. I'm coming to you from my house in Utah, where we have been self-isolating for like four months. It feels like four years. So it's really nice to see some of your faces I can see on the screen. I grew up with fairy tales. And this is a, one of the books I grew up with. There was a two volume set. And you, I don't know if you can see, I mean, it's completely falling apart because I reread this over and over and over again when I was a kid. And it really laid the foundation of my imagination. And I loved the very first one, and this one was Cinderella. And I loved this because uh, she went to the ball three times. And so there were three different gowns. There's that one. And there was this one. And then there was also the wedding gown at the end. So, And I love to look at those pictures. And I love the story of Cinderella. But I was never provoked to write a story about it because I kind of felt like it already did its own thing. Um, but there was a... The story right after Cinderella in this book was called The Goose Girl. And this was actually my favorite story. And it wasn't my favorite story because it satisfied me and made me go, ah, oh, what a great story after finishing reading it like I often do. Instead, it was my favorite because it kept me asking questions. And it didn't solve everything for me. And I was confused and a little bit irritated as I thought through um, all the things that happened. For example, so let me tell you briefly what the story of the Goose Girl is. It starts out with a princess and her mother wants her to marry a king in another land. And um, so she is sent to the other land with nobody but her talking horse, who never talks by the way. It just says it's a talking horse. And her lady in waiting. So she and her lady in the waiting make a long trip. And I always think, why is that all that went with her? Why wasn't anybody else there? What about her parents? Nobody took her there. And then midway through the forest, the lady in waiting betrays her and steals her dress and her horse, the talking horse, by the way, who doesn't say anything. And then they arrive in the kingdom and the lady in the waiting says that she's the princess because nobody's met the princess. And they make the princess um, give her a job as a goose girl. So she hides out as a goose girl and takes care of the geese. And then she starts being able to control the wind. And I, the story didn't explain how or why, and it made me really, really interested and I wanted to know more. So I always wanted to write it into a longer story, um, but I did not for many, many years. I'm gonna share my screen for a second and show you some pictures. All right, is that up okay? So this is an, um, an Arthur Rackham image of, Arthur Rackham did many illustrations of, of fairy tales and they're among my favorites. And most of the fairy tales I grew up with were of the European tradition, but of course there are fairy tales and folk tales from all around the world. But these were the ones that I knew when I was a kid. Now I've written quite a number of books uh, that are fairy tale based. I've published over 30 books and these are this and also this. These are all books that were inspired by fairy tales. So you can see it's like fairy tales are something that I've been wrestling with and interested in for a long time. This quote, which turns out, I love this quote, it turns out it's not actually an accurate quote. It's Neil Gaiman sort of quoting G.K. Chesterton, but it is, fairy tales don't tell us that dragons exist. They tell us that dragons can be defeated. And that's something I think about a lot as I write fairy tales. So imagine little me growing up with my book, reading stories. And as I get older, you can see that the stories I read might mean different, something different to me at this age than, than the previous. I mean something here and they did the previous. And as I grew older, I began to take different things from the fairy tales. And a lot of the questions that I had were about what does it mean to be a girl? And um, so many of the fairy tales are about girls, but they're about girls who, it seems like sometimes they don't matter until they're married. And that was a question I often had. What is the power that a girl has and is it only relative to her being able to, to uh, be attractive to and 
uh, get a man to notice and care about her. Um, spoiler, it isn't. But those are the questions that are going through my mind that fairy tales helped me think about. And one of my favorite writers, probably my favorite writer from when I was younger was Robin McKinley. And she wrote, uh, her first book that she published was called Beauty. And it was based on her favorite fairy tale, which is Beauty and the Beast. So when I was in grad school, when I had been writing for 15 years and I'd gotten a master's degree in creative writing, and I finally thought, I think I'm ready to write a book. I've written a lot of short stories and poetry, but I'd never written a book. And so I decided I would write a book and I was like, what could I possibly write? What matters enough that I could spend a whole book on it? And I took inspiration from Rob McKinley and I returned to my favorite fairy tale from my youth, which was The Goose Girl. Here was a picture of the Arthur, Arthur Rackham did. Um, here she is with the geese. And here she is combing her hair and the goose boy tries to pull her hair. And so she sends the wind to blow his hat away and he has to chase it. And all of these questions kept pestering me. Why, how, why, how? I wanted to get inside the story. I wanted to understand it. Like a three page story was just not enough for me. And I wanted, and I wanted to be true to the original story. So I ended up writing The Goose Girl over a four year period. It took me quite a lot of time. And back then, when I started, there was no internet. So when I had questions like, what does a beef tallow candle smell like? I had to go to libraries or find one in real life and smell it. Um, <laughs> there was no online searching. And I spent so much time, so much time doing research. But so I wrote The Goose Girl. And then when I tried to publish it, I got rejected a lot. Here are my rejection letters, not just for this book, for, but for other things as well. I laminated them together in a long roll. I had many rejections for the Goose Girl. And this is just one. As you can see, I underlined a couple lines. One of the reasons why they said they rejected it was many young adult books are becoming more and more edgy. They didn't feel like my book was edgy enough. And that if I insisted on a traditional retelling of a fairy tale that I should, I should work on short stories for young readers, that, that there was no place for that in young adult literature. And that was very discouraging for me for a long time. But eventually someone did say yes and publish it. And uh, the year it came out, actually, it, it won, there's the first two covers of it. It won an award that teens across the US voted it, one of their top 10 favorite books of the year. So it did find an audience, um, but it did take a while. Here's the current um, cover for it. And I wrote actually three sequels to it. How do you write a sequel to a fairy tale? Well, I just, developed characters in the first book that I wanted to keep following. And so even though the next three books are not fairy, based on fairy tales themselves, I took inspiration from them, uh, from, from the first one to, to create them. Uh, I'll say something about Anna Burning, which was the second book. It made me, that book more than any, made me really realize the power of fantasy and fairy tale in many ways, because I decided to write a book about a girl who could speak the language of fire. And I tried to take that very literally. I did a lot of research on fire. I also did research on obsession and addiction. And to try to understand what it would feel like and try to be true to who that character was and what it would be like to actually be able to control fire. And then when people read that book, I got so many letters telling me that they knew exactly what I was trying to say with that book. I was trying to uh, give parallels to what it was like to be in an abusive relationship, or I was trying to use it as a metaphor to say what it's like to have a disability, or I was using it as a metaphor for drug addiction, or I was, and I, there's so many reasons, uh, so many things that were very clear to the reader. And I think that's the magic of this kind of storytelling of fairy tales is that um, the reader can find their own story within it. And if I had tried to use it as a metaphor for one thing, I think I would have failed. But by try being true to the magical essence of it, um, readers were able to come to it and supply their own story. Uh, the next book I did, I'm not gonna talk about all my books, just, but just a few. But the next book I did was called Princess Academy. And this was an original idea. It wasn't based on a fairy tale. But the, I, the idea behind it is, um, there's a village at the top of a mountain. They quarry stone for a living. 
And one day a messenger comes from the lowlands, from the king, where none of them have ever been, and says that there's a tradition in their country that the prince, that the priests uh, uh, do a ceremony to, to find out which place the prince's future bride will come from. So as soon as he's of age, they do the ceremony, and then they choose, he chooses a bride from that place in their country. Well, this time they chose, they said that the place was Mount Eskel, which is this tiny little village at the top of a mountain. And so they create an academy for all the girls who, who live there to go to learn what they need to know in case they're chosen to be the princess, because none of them have been to school before. And they think it's crazy that they, that they don't believe it's even possible that they would get married. They can't even imagine it. They don't understand why they should go to school in the first place. They, all they do, they cut stones out of the ground for a living. What good is school going to do them? They're very suspicious of the whole thing. It's not like a, Ooh, I might be a princess kind of a thing at all. And, uh, and, but they all go and start attending and then they start to realize they start learning things that changes, change their lives, all working up to the point when there's going to be a ball and a prince. And it wasn't until my eighth draft that I went, and it probably went through, I don't know, 15 or so, 15 or 20 drafts. Um, about my eighth draft, I went, oh, this could, be a re this could be considered a retelling of Cinderella. And it hadn't even entered my mind before that point. And I think it shows just how pervasive those stories from my youth were. They just worked into my brain, uh, laid a foundation there. With the Goose Girl, I done a very literal retelling. I decided I want to be true to the original story. It had lasted for hundreds of years in oral retellings. Um, I felt like there was a, a strength and an importance to that story that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to expand it, but not change it. I want to stay true to the essence of it. But when I wrote Princess Academy, I am fundamentally changing what the story of Cinderella is. And so I hadn't allowed myself to consider that that's what I was doing. But something that's important to me is the very essence of a fairy tale is that it is plastic, it's flexible, it is very easy to retell in your own way. Because without retellings, they wouldn't exist at all. Fairy tales do not have like one true author. They were passed down, usually by women, mothers and grandmothers retelling them to their children. And as you can imagine, every time, every mother or grandmother, every time they told the story, it wouldn't have been exactly the same because it wasn't memorized. And what was happening in the kids' lives and in the world around them would change the way they told it. And each generation, different things might become important to them. And so the cultural changes would also affect it. So it, who knows how many versions there were. Um, so I've seen folklorists, um, say that, for example, Snow White and Cinderella have dozens of different versions around the world that were written down. So who knows how many that weren't? And many of these have been made into movies, for example, from Disney. But Disney can't be the one true source either, because it's not a fairy tale unless it can be retold. And the very existence of lots of different retellings, what that does is it invites readers to step in and do their own. And that is very, that's very exciting. Um, this is a side note of uh, many of the stories Shakespeare told had, he wasn't the first one to tell them. He was doing retellings of other stories other people had told. And just by, and we've done a lot of, re, uh, people have done a lot of retellings of Shakespeare stories too. That, that's an invitation to say, this is interactive. Come in, tell your own story, find your own meaning in it. Um, so that was Princess Academy. Oh, this is what the cover looks like now because that cover changed too. And I also made two more of that one. I get really fond of my characters and I don't want to leave them. And so I just keep going. Now this story, the next fairy tale I retold, this one was a little different experience. Because I told you I loved Cinderella, even though I really wanted to mess with the ending and a lot of the details of it when I did Princess Academy. And I loved the goose girl, even though I had a lot of questions for it. But one day I was reading the Grimm's uh, fairy tale book and I came across one that I hadn't really remembered before. It hadn't been in my big old fat illustrated version 
I just discovered one of the, you know, it's just a little three page story and it was called Maid Moline. And this is, um, let me give you the essence of this story. Uh, so the way it begins is there's a princess and she wants to marry a prince. Um, but her father wants her to marry this other king. You see how many princesses there are being forced into marriages? Isn't that interesting? Anyway, she refuses to marry this king. So to punish her, her father locks her up in a tower for seven years and he bricks up the windows and the doors and locks her in there with nobody but her maid. And you know, if we were in person or even if my, somehow I'm screen sharing and my chat is not up. So um, I can't ask you to reply immediately, but, but I want you to think about, think as a writer, what questions do you have about that story that you would need to answer in order to turn it into a longer piece that's really fleshed out? Um, when I'm at school visits, I hear stories like, what do they eat? Where do they go to the bathroom? These are very practical and good questions that as a writer, you do have to answer. Otherwise, the reader's gonna be bothered by that the whole time. So I do have to get into the bathroom issue. Absolutely, it's pre-indoor plumbing. And, um, but the thing that really bothered me about this, and it made me really angry, is the stories about the princess and there's her maid. They spend seven years in the tower and they do eventually escape and that's the first half of the story. The second half of the story continues on to tell you about what happened to the princess next. And it never mentions the maid again. And that made me so mad because although of course it's unjust punishment that the princess got locked up for not marrying this, this guy, um, it was in response to her choice. What choice did the maid have in all of this? And after that whole experience, like the most important part of that story would be the relationship between the maid and the princess. And we never hear about it and we never get to hear what happens to the maid and she never gets her own story. And I felt like that was a tragedy. And that story just nagged me at the back of my mind for uh, several years until finally I went, I have to write this. And I decided to write it. It's the first time I did a first person, um, narration. Usually I did third person, so I would say she did this or that. It's the first time I did I. And not only was it first person, but it was a journal. And I wanted to be as close to that character as possible and make it about her. And it was, a, that was the most joy I've ever had writing this story. So that became Book of a Thousand Days. These were the first two covers. This is the current cover. I'm going to tell you about one more fairy tale. Rapunzel, the worst fairy tale of all time. It's a tragedy, this fairy tale. How did this fairy tale get retold as something that was nice for girls to hear? It's an atrocity, my friends. Let me just remind you of Rapunzel. So there's a the woman gets pregnant. She sees some fresh veggies in a garden. She wants some. Her husband goes and steals them for her, which is already horrible. Like, what were the circumstances that she couldn't get fresh vegetables as a pregnant woman? That's very sad. Poverty is an issue. And this, and this uh, story skirts around it, but you know that poverty and starvation were at the base of so many of these stories because it was so much, it's a reality for us today in this world, but even more so back then. And then uh, this witch says, okay, well, then you can have him, but I have to, I get your firstborn. And they just, they just say, okay. Now remember, this witch never does any magic in this story. And this is something, it's like that talking horse doesn't talk. I'm sorry. You can have a witch. I want to see some magic, please. I want to see some power. The only power she has is was to horrible steal a baby from parents. Like if she, I want to see her like force them, right? Where, otherwise you're like, why do they just let her, what is she going to do if, she, if they don't? Anyway, so she takes this baby and she locks her up in a tower where she's alone. 
and she, her hair grows really long and never explains why. And then when the witch wants to visit her, she climbs up her hair. And I appreciate this, this painting. This is from Paul Zielinski's Rapunzel that puts it on a hook. Um, so at least you're not wondering like, how? Because that had to have hurt. And then a prince comes and he climbs up the hair and he visits her many times before the witch discovers him and casts him out. And I would like to know about this prince, the most useless prince in all of stories, that in all the times he comes and visits her, did he ever think to bring a ladder? A rope would do. I imagine he has a sword. Could they not have cleverly cut off her hair and tied it up and used it as a rope to get down? No, he leaves her in the tower and keeps coming to visit her where no one else can see her. And either this guy is up to no good, which I strongly suspect, because the story does get PG-13 in just a minute, or he's as dumb as a box of rocks, in which case, why would this girl want him if it didn't even occur to him to help her get out of this tower? Eventually he gets blinded and she gets cast out and she wanders. She gives birth to twins. This is the PG-13 party part of it. And then she finds him and she cries and somehow her tears are magical and cure his blindness, which he doesn't deserve. And they end up together supposedly happily ever after, but we all have to question that. The worst, the worst story. So when I retold this one, I couldn't, I wasn't going to give it the goose girl treatment where I'm like, going to honor the essence of the story because there's some universal truth. No, Rapunzel does not deserve that. We went as far away from it as we possibly could. And um, really, we looked at settings. So my husband, I say we, because my husband and I did this together, and this was illustrated by Nathan Hale. Um, we looked at the setting. When you change the setting of a story, it immediately affects all the elements of it. So when you break a story, fairy tales are very easy to break down into these raw elements. And you keep the, the main elements, but change the setting. Suddenly all the elements are like plants in a different ground. So we planted this one in a desert instead of a forest and what's gonna happen, for example. You plant the story on the moon, you're gonna get a different kind of, kind of story. We did the Old West. We wanted to make this a big old Hollywood Western. And this was our, also our first uh, graphic novel. So again, these, these are uh, paintings that Nathan Hale did to show the, the setting, aren't they gorgeous? These are just watercolors he did as studies before we started the book. And by putting her in the Old West, here, instead of a tower, it's actually a, a magical tree because our witch actually has powers. She has growth powers. And so she makes this little tall tree that um, has like a chamber inside where Rapunzel is trapped and it's too tall for her to get out. And she spends years up there and her hair grows because of the growth magic. And she it gets so long, she braids it, and she starts to, to practice with it and use, do, use her hair for something useful. And she starts to use it like as a whip and a lasso, and she just gets stronger and stronger, and her hair gets longer until the day that she manages to escape from the tower, and she becomes a vigilante hero um, fighting giant rattlesnakes and coyotes and bandits and stuff. This is absolutely my... Rapunzel is completely used to this. I'm turning it upside down. And it works because fairy tales are like that. They're so flexible that they will let you in and let, help you let you retell it in, in a new way that makes it relevant for you. On the Princess in Black series uh, are not, I wouldn't call them fairy tales per se, but they are definitely a genre mash, matchups, mashup. So we took a, a superhero genre and a fairy tale genre and what happens when we put those two together and that was our exploration with this series um, these were also co-written with my husband and i and and illustrated by Laywin fam my best friend in the whole world and i just want everyone to be so comfortable saying her name because sometimes people get intimidated by the spelling they're not sure how to pronounce it it's very simple Laywin, Laywin fam vietnamese name she and I, among other things, did Real Friends. And this is the last um, book that I'll, I'll show up in the presentation and we'll get ready to do some questions. So Real Friends is actually a, mem a memoir. It's a true story. It's me. It's my first true, true uh, life nonfiction story I've ever done, published. It's actually stories about me when I was a kid. 
And so you wouldn't think that fairy tale elements would might be applicable here. Um, but because I grew up on fairy tales and they're hard coded into my imagination, if you look for the evidence, it's all over. So for example, when I ever I'm trying to explain how things felt or worked, I revert to the language, the metaphors that, that fairy tales taught me because that's what I grew up with in my most, you know, in my earliest um, brain building blocks. So here I'm talking about how my group of friends felt like a royal court and the popular girl was like the queen. My best friend was the princess and I was the court jester. And if I felt like if I could keep them laughing, keep them entertained, then they might keep me around. But if ever I fail to do that, then I didn't have any function and I'd, they, I'd have to hit the road. For example, here, when I'm trying to explain what it felt like to grow up with my older sister, who was often very scary to me, I revert to the language of fairy tales. Um, their fairy tales are full of people turning into animals and specifically bears. I've yet to actually, it just occurs to me, ever have a review or anybody point out um, all the fairy tale connections in the book. But the, but the bear metaphor, very much a Snow White, Rose Red, stories like this of people turning into bears um, are very common. And so it was an easy way to show this is how it felt to me to live in the same house with my sister felt like living in a house with a grizzly bear, a wild animal that you just never knew what was gonna happen next. And even an image like this. So this is commentary on the saying, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I wanted to show, because it's a graphic novel, and so you wanna show as much rather than tell. I wanted to show how that felt, how this girl, Jenny, um, who, was quite hard on me verbally. You can say you want sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But it doesn't feel that way. And so I wanted to show that in a single image, which Leyland Pham gorgeously illustrated. But also there's the element here in fairy tales, so often words can become objects. Um, the girl that gets lost in the wood and meets an old lady and is kind to her and shares her food and she is blessed with uh, gold coins and jewels fall out of her mouth every time she speaks. Whereas the mean stepsister who's cruel to the old lady, you know, slimy frogs come out of her mouth whenever she speaks. And that's a very fairy tale element where our words um, become actual objects to show people what is inside uh, of us. That's just what comes out um, and becomes very clear. And that's, this is a very a strong fairy tale image. What Jenny says comes out as sticks and stones, just as it would in a fairy tale. I, um, I'm gonna stop sharing now. There we go. Yay. I would love, I'm gonna open up my chat, to uh, use some time here now to answer any questions that you have. Anything we were just talking about, that you have uh, follow-up questions for, or um, any other questions about anything else you want to ask me. Now is the time for us to get to know each other. I'm gonna flip through and see. Oh, I see someone raising hands. So you can either write it in the chat or um, Diane can um, call on people and unmute you. Emily, go ahead and can you unmute yeah. yourself? There you go. I I wonder if people if in the story about the one with the the maid in the tower yeah he brick the king mm. bricked up the windows does that mean it was dark because that was before modern electricity what if the candle went out. These are the practical questions, Emily. If you were to write that story into a book, you would have to answer. You are absolutely right. So they, they had a supply of firewood that was supposed to last them seven years, and they had a supply of candles that was supposed to last them for seven years. Um, 
so it was mostly dark. It was mostly dark. And uh, there are some images in this book. I'm going to find, there are some pictures because it's done like a, like a, it's got done like a journal, but she, um, she draws some pictures in here. So here's a picture of her that she drew of the princess sitting by the fire. You would just be so hungry for light. In a really wonderful part, they get a cat and having a cat in that darkness just makes all the difference. That cat is called my Lord the cat and it's just my favorite cat of all time. Wow. So they have a little flap in one of the walls, a metal flap that opens up to the outside. And so they put a wooden spoon in there to try to keep it open so they can get fresh air to come in. And that's also where they dump out their waste. And here's a terrible thing. Rats get into the tower. Now, I love rats. We had pet rats and I'm actually quite fond of, I don't think there's an animal I don't like. I love animals. They all do their thing, except for mosquitoes. If I could just swap all the mosquitoes in the world for gnats, like I'm not, I'm not opposed to bugs in general, but mosquitoes are just the worst. I know. Right? <laughs> but anyway, rats are really dangerous in some circumstances in that they multiply really fast. And if you have a limited food supply and they eat it and spoil it, then you die. So um, they not only eat their food, but their candles. And so it's right. part of her journey or part of her mission in this, to try to keep their supplies safe from the rats. And here is a rat trap based on real rat traps that people sometimes made that she made. Can you see that? So she, this is a barrel and she drove nails up through the lid of the barrel. And then she put a piece of parchment or fabric on the top to hide those. And then she hung some cheese above it so that when the rat jumps to try to get the cheese, it will land on that and splat it will kill the rat. So this is, you know, an improvised rat trap when you don't have one handy. And it worked, but not well enough. Oh, and here's our, our hero, heroine, Doshti, with her little self-portrait there. Let me see, there was one picture I was trying to find for you. Here's what their uh, house looks like on the inside. You can see the hearth, um, there are three levels. There's storage down below, and there's the bedroom up above, and then there's the hearth in the middle and the extra firewood. And their supplies are supposed to last seven years, but they do not last long enough. But I won't tell you what happens. The king should have thought of that. Rats. Yes. King should have thought of rats. I don't know that it was common custom to lock people up in towers for seven years, so they probably didn't think it through very well. I think it was yeah. probably a rash decision that he did because he was so proud and, and the fact that his daughter defied him threatened him too much and uh, his sense of self too much. He has to be always right and everybody has to do exactly what he wants, which is a horrible way to be. And, but you know, things don't turn out well for him, so don't worry about him. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So how do, do characters that you make up for your stories feel real to you right away? Or do you have to like build them out in some way to sort of make them come to life for you? Is that Zoe that yeah. asked that? Okay, hello Zoe. Um, are you a writer, Zoe? Um, I like the idea of writing. <laughs> <laughs> have you written any characters that you... Have not problems. recently. I've like attempted to, but it always kind of feels flat to me. That's kind of, that's why I'm wondering about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for sure. Whenever I start to answer a craft question, I feel like I need to, to just to say the caveat that, um, when I'm with other writers, if we talk about how we do it, what we do, like everybody's way is different. So if anybody ever tries to tell you this is the way to do things, mm -hmm. 
that means it's their way of doing things, but there's just no way for any writer, or any creative to tell anybody the right way of doing anything. Um, but for, for me, when I create characters, I think, so I've been writing for quite a while and I, um, I don't have one process only. And so I've, I've tried, I've written in a lot of different ways. Um, and when I, when I first started writing out, I just kind of felt the characters. They just felt in a certain way. And I never based them on anybody. Um, and I just get the, kind of the sense of them. And so it's hard for me to explain how I, I wrote that way. But there are other ways I've written too, where if I'm not quite getting into it, or I really want to try a different kind of character for this, I will actually look up like personality quiz tests. So if you're familiar with Myers-Briggs, it's one I'm really f very familiar with. There are like 16 different personality types. And I will even like look at one of those uh, for someone who's got a different personality type than I do. And like kind of study like what decisions they would make, how do, what kind of relationships do they form? What are their strengths and weaknesses? How do they interact with people um, in different kinds of settings? And that helps me as I start to form a character. Sometimes I'll just jump in and start writing and just put a character in a situation, see what they do, and that tells me what, they're, mm -hmm. what kind of character they are. And sometimes I pre-plan um, where I really write out what their character is like, write lots of adjectives for them, I'll write dialogue for them, I'll have pages of information about them, and then outline extensively and then write. So I've done lots of and everything in between. Shannon, do you see the question in the chat there to you? Oh, okay. The Princess in Black series features some pink covers and it's about a princess, but it's very popular with boys as well as girls. How did you manage this? Well, <laughs> first of all, I have to say, oh, that's heavy. <sighs> it's handy to have a book. <laughs> when I'm doing these, I have a shelf of my books right there. So there's one that has a pink cover but I just have to give a shout out to all the beautiful colors. So the first one had a blue cover, the second one a pink, and then we had green, gold, purple, red, and teal is the most recent one. So, uh, you know, when I, when I first came up with this idea and we started shopping it around to different publishers, I told every publisher, there were a lot of people rejected it, first of all. And they just didn't think that, um, because I insisted on it being this, um, this format where it's a full color illustration to every page. It's about 80, 90 pages and about 2,500 words. And when we were writing it, except for Mercy Watson, most chapter books, they kind of jumped from early readers to 10 to 15,000 words. There weren't a lot of, of books like this. And so people don't think anyone would buy it. But anyway, um, what I told every publisher when I was passing around is that it's really important to me that um, this book not be ever labeled as a girl book because it's something that really bothers me is when people try to tell anybody who a book is for. And especially when they're like, if, if the book is about a girl, that only girls will like it, that boys are not allowed to read books about girls. I, I just have to say, I've seen a lot of girls on here Girls, can you imagine having never read a book about a boy? Can you even conceive of that? Isn't that weird? Or, or, or a man as we grow older. And yet there are boys and men who have never read a book about a female character. Um, I've met thousands of them. And it's alarming to me because reading is supposed to be uh, one of the greatest things about it is that we learn empathy for people different from us. We definitely want to be able to read books that reflect ourselves back in, in our personalities or, or our life circumstance or our race or abilities or anything like that. We, that is really comforting to see yourself represented. But we also like to read books about people different from us. So we learn empathy for people that aren't just like us. And raising boys in a world where they're not learning empathy for girls, that breaks my heart and just seems like clearly wrong. And yet, um, that's something I've dealt with all of my career is people telling me that 
boys will not read your books because they're about girls. I also have some books about boys, but the ones about girls. Um, and it's something I've had to fight against. So I had been writing long enough to know that that's exactly what they would try to do with Princess in Black. A lot of these publishers would try to label it a girl book and just market it to girls. And I was like, listen, it's about a girl. It's about a superhero. In fact, it's about a princess, but I don't want it marketed or labeled as a girl book in any way. And Candle has been awesome. Not everybody agreed with that. Some people didn't think that was possible. And it's got a ton of boy readers because thus it's a book of, like nobody, do you, do people really think about that when they're picking a book? Like I, I've asked thousands of kids, what kind of books do you like to read? And what I hear are, I like fantasy. Like think right now, if you were to ask someone, ask you, what kind of book do you like to read? I might hear humor. I might hear graphic novels. I might hear adventure stories, that kind of stuff. I've never had anybody say, I like to read books about boys. Like no one's, that's not how readers think, but it's like weird adults, like freaking out and thinking that that's going to be helpful and it's not. Anyway. You have another question there. What book was the hardest for you to write? Yeah. And was there a reason why? That's yeah. It's, it, I, I've learned it's impossible to tell from a final draft of a book what the experience was like to write it. So uh, this book was a joy for me at every stage. And I don't know why it just kind of gave itself uh, to me. Uh, the, the, the main character, although she's very different from me, I just understood her oh, thank you. right away. But the hardest book, and it's the fourth book in, in my Goose Girl series. And the reason why is because um, the main character is very quiet and she, she aches and has a lot of, I guess we would say now anxiety, but she doesn't know why or how she herself doesn't know. And so she wasn't able to tell me, I know that sounds weird. Like it's, she's a real person, but I did draft after draft and I couldn't figure her out because she wasn't talking to me. And it wasn't until many drafts in that I had a realization that's now a central point of the book. And if you read the book, you're like, you didn't know that from the beginning? I did not know it. And once I knew it, I was like, oh, that's why she's like this. And then it still was a lot of rewriting because I'd already done so many drafts and done them badly that I still had to, it's like, when you really don't get a book, for the first draft and you're really on the wrong track it's kind of like adults know that it's more expensive to renovate a house than to build a new one you know it's like almost harder um but that's just what happens sometimes so this was this was a really really tough one and i kept thinking as i was writing it oh there's somebody this is for somebody needs this or i wouldn't have to keep doing this and i have met like maybe five like just a handful of people in my life who, who were like, I felt like that book was for me. And I was like, oh, it's you. Why did you make me have to write this book? <laughs> but I'm very glad it exists now. I have a question for you. Yeah. What, uh, what is the last book that you read that, that made you fall in love with books all over again? I think we all go up and down, and, but then you pick something up and you say, yeah, this is why I love books so much. Oh, there's so, you know what? It's so many. I've actually, there's so many. I've been reading a lot of graphic novels and I just adore graphic novels. Um, but the most recent novel that I read that I was like, oh yes, it's called Ray Bearer by Jordan Ifwako and it comes out in August. So it's not out yet, but um, she is, um, she I think her parents were immigrants from Nigeria and she was born in the U.S. But she infuses, the, it's a fantasy novel and she infuses a rich culture of many different um, African cultures uh, inspired the setting for the book. And mm -hmm. it's just beautifully done and her writing is exquisite. So I really enjoyed that one. Yeah, look out for, for Ray Barrow. That's a good one. Okay. Oh, I got another question. This is off the subject of fairy tales, but will there be any more Squirrel Girl books? My students love her. Oh my gosh, I love Squirrel Girls so much. 
So Squirrel Girl, um, Squirrel Girl is a Marvel superhero, if any of you don't know her. And she has the powers of Squirrel and also the powers of Girl. I love these end pages. <laughs> pages aren't those pretty? And she fights crime with her best pal, her best squirrel pal, Tippy Toe, and her best uh, human pal, Anna Sophia. And it's, um, so she has a comic book. There's many comic books about her, but we got to write the first novels about her. And she's so optimistic. And I get kind of crushed sometimes by the bad news of the world. And so it was like such a joy to write from the point of view of someone who really like sees the best in other people and not only other people, but the best in herself. Like that, that's harder for me to get to because I can be so critical of myself, but like she genuinely thinks that she's awesome. And it's not like it's, you know, there's anything wrong with that. Like, why can't we all think that we're awesome? Cause, cause we are like, she loves her eight foot squirrel tail. She thinks it's amazing. <laughs> why wouldn't it be? <laughs> And that's something she would definitely get teased for in middle school, but, you know, but she has that wonderful passion and a clear sense of, of how diverse everybody is and how unique and how cool it is that everybody's so different. Um, anyway, so, uh, oh, will there be more? Um, we have not been asked to write more, so we don't own the copyright for Squirrel Girl, of course, Marvel does, and oh, we haven't been asked to do more, so, but it, you never know in the future. That would be fun. Um, oh, well, there's something here that says, my son Brady has a question. Do we want to find Brady and unmute that? Sarah. There he is. Oh, you had Brady. Um, hey, now ask your question. How did they write books and made them? So like, like, with covers and with the pages all together yeah. and all of that? Yeah, like, like, if I was going to say, like, one of your books right now behind you, that's, like, made. Right. So when they get published, they, they print up the pages, they bind them all together. Um, they, they're actually kind of, like, <clears throat> sewn in when they're hardcovers or they're glued in. And they make the, it's actually quite an involved process. And it's one that I'm not involved in. There are special factories that make it. So we, we, I write the words and I send them a word file and then other people uh, format it in a different kind of software. And then they send it to the factory and they also send them the images that they hire artists to do the cover art, which I don't do. And if there's any interior art, someone else is hired to do that. I don't do that. And then those experts that know how to do it, put it all together. And that's the best answer I can give you because I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know that. You know another question, Brady? Yeah. Who made the brown bear, brown bear book? <laughs> brown bear, brown bear? What do you yeah. see? Yeah. That's Eric Carle. Oh. Yeah. He did a lot of picture books. He did sure. like The Very oh, Hungry Caterpillar and um, I'm blanking no more. But anyway, he did a ton of books. He wrote yeah. and illustrated them. So he did those all. Yeah. All right. Uh, Somebody would like to know if you outline your books. Oh, yeah. How you organize. And then I read it too. And then You're, I read that book too. You read the book too, the Brown Bear, Brown Bear book? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. I love it. I like the one too about the chameleon. I can't think of what it's called. Um, do I outline my books? So I do, um, if I could go through, and I will not. I will spare you. <laughs> Tell you what degree I outlined or did not, and it would be different for every single one. So when I co-write, um, like with my husband, that's when I outline the most extensively. So when we co-write, uh, like this, for example, or our Wonder Woman graphic novel, um, like the the outline for this book was much longer than the script ended up being for the book. Because um, when you co-write, you have to really get it all worked out in advance. And when I write a, uh, by the way, when you write a graphic novel, it's different than writing a novel um, because you have to write a script. So like I would say page 62, panel one, and I would describe everything that's in the panel. 
even though there's no words on this, I still wrote a paragraph describing this so that the artist would know. And then I would write panel two and I would just write a paragraph describing this. Panel three, I'd write a paragraph describing the visual and then I'd also include that dialogue, et cetera. So writing a graphic novel is, there's way more that, you, that I wrote than you ever see on the page. Whereas with Princess in Black and in picture books, um, everything that we wrote is here. We did not describe the images like we would in a graphic novel. So with picture books and chapter books like this, um, we don't give any art notes. That's totally up to the illustrator. The text has to stand on its own. And then the illustrator comes in and enhances it by adding beautiful images. So it's a very different process in graphic novels. All right, let's see any other questions. Um, when you did Diana, Princess of the Amazons about a girl isolated with all of her grownups who is desperate for a friend, did you know that we would all be quarantining? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like Diana, except for when she befriends the enemy. Yes, no, isn't that crazy? We wrote this book about a girl who's isolated on an island with, a, you know, there's no other kids and she's alone with the grownups. And then, you know, it comes out and like two months later, we're all isolated on our own little islands. We actually did a video uh, when so we started quarantining. My husband and I did a video for DC Comics about, you know, at home Amazon activities, things that you could do while you're quarantining to be like Diana. Um, but no, it sure, it has become more relevant recently though, hasn't it? No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did we want to do that last activity, Diane, before we... Uh, sure. Yep, so if you would all make sure you've got your chat open. Does everybody know how to do that? Are you all good? Everybody get your chat open. We're gonna play just a little bit. So we have lots of resourceful heroines in Shannon Hale's books, but there are four of them in particular that I, that I like. I'm gonna hold this up so you can see it. There is the Princess in Black, and there's Ani. Is it Ani, Shannon? Do you say Ani or do you say Annie? You know what's funny is I'm a visual person that way, and so I, I say Annie and Ani. I say Falada and Falada. I, I don't have one way that I say names, so whatever you like is... I call her Ani. Um, we have Shannon, who appears in her two graphic novels, and... We have Lizzie Hartz. Okay, you got those four characters, everybody? Those four heroines? I'm gonna give you some fairy tale characters and I want you to type in which of those four heroines is gonna get these fairy tale characters out of the trouble they're in. Are you ready? First, you have to figure out what the fairy tale is. Can you all see that? Do you know what the fairy tale is? Type it in if you know what it is, or just hit your space bar and say it out loud. This is the elves and the shoemaker. Good job. Now, which one of those four heroines is the one that's gonna be the most helpful for those elves. Princess in black, Ani, remember? She's the uh, talented wind speaker and the gentle one, very genuine. We have the princess in black who's a little plucky and non-traditional. We have Shannon who's just trying to follow her heart. <laughs> and we have Lizzie Hartz who really believes that nothing is impossible. All right, type it in. Who's gonna help the elves? I'll type mine in, but not till you type first. <laughs> and if you can type really, really simply why, Shannon might like to see that.
Type faster. <laughs> there are no right answers here. Uh, no, there is definitely not a right answer. Whatever you think. I feel like I can make a case for all of them. Yep. I actually, as I thought about these, you probably could for all of them, but it is kind of fun to think about. Yeah. Oh, Shannon is a powerful storyteller. Oh, that's a good one for sure. Anybody else typing? I'll show you another one. I do think that Ani would, she would help. Like she would be very encouraging to them, yep. and supportive. Yep. I think Lizzie would just take over. I think she could be very <laughs> effective and just tell them exactly what to do. They might not like that, but I think she could get the job done. <laughs> Princess in Black would probably just push him aside and do it herself. She would battle that shoe. She would yeah. battle it. <laughs> because she probably never made it before, but the elves need help. Right, Emily. Okay, I'm going to show you another one. Are you ready? You remember who the four are? Princess in Black, Ani, Shannon, or Lizzie Hartz from Ever After. Ready? Who is it, you guys? So which of the two characters are they need to Belle. help? Belle. Okay. Who would be most helpful to Belle? Which one of those four is going to be the one that can help Belle? Not that Belle needs any help, by the way, let me just say. I think Belle did just fine. I'm telling you, Bell likes to read. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> they got you pegged, Shannon. <laughs> Look at that. Kind of universal. There's consensus. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Prince of Black could make sure he behaved. That's true. That's right. <laughs> That's a good one. I think it would be nice for Bell to have a friend to talk to. Oh, yeah. all of that. Yep. Okay. Anybody else typing? Got one more. Actually, I have a bunch more, but I'll do one more. <laughs> Ready? Who is it, you guys? Who's going to handle what's under that bridge? Thank you, Zoe. Yep. Who's going to handle what's under the bridge? Bonnie, because she could befriend. A good one. Oh, yeah, for Belle. Yeah. Yep. Who would help the Billy Goats? Yeah, I think there's a strong case to be made for Princess in Black. <laughs> yeah, the Princess in Black and the Underbridge troll waged battle. It, you know, it writes itself. That troll is nobody's friend. I will say by the end of the Goose Girl series, though, Ani is ridiculously powerful yes she is so she could very easily take care of any threat though she's not a violent person gosh i love that book i seriously love that book oh thank you not kidding anybody so, else want to jump in i do think lizzie could take care of it too yeah yeah, she's a lot stronger than she thinks she is. She could play croquet with the troll's head and <laughs> she have could. no qualms about it. That's right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, Princess of Black. I think that's a that's a good one. 
Does anybody else have any other questions they would like to ask? While you think about that, I want to tell you that the Fairy Tale and Folklore Festival is made possible in part by funding from the Minnesota Department of Education through a special thing called the Library Services and Technology Act grant. That's out of the Institute of Museum and Library Services. You will be getting an emailed survey, my friends, that it would be real helpful to us if you could fill that out. There are more fairy tale events coming up. Um, fairy tale trivia. We'll see how much you know. Um, Jessica Day George will be speaking, as well as Jacqueline West, two other authors. Um, there's a Beauty and the Beast story walk and a Rumpelstiltskin story walk coming up both in Waseca and Lesur. So if you have questions about those things, you know who to call, right? Do you all know who to call? Ghostbusters. Not, I was just going to no. say, not <laughs> Ghostbusters. Uh, I got it wrong. Oh. oh, there is one more question for you there, Shannon. If you oh. that How did you come up with the names for the characters in the Goose Girl series and Princess Academy? Um, oh, Emily had the same idea as me. Uh, some of them have stayed with me, even though it's been years since I've read the books. Thank you. Um, so Goose Girl, uh, sometimes when I'm creating a fantasy world, I like to take inspiration from a real place and real time period to help create the elements that to make, make it feel really realistic. So with Goose Girl, because um, it was the German, strongly a German fairy tale, uh, and I had German ancestry, I really spent a lot of time studying uh, Germany in, you know, hundreds of years ago. And so I took a lot of the names from Germanic roots and the same with Princess Academy. I also have Scandinavian blood. So I based that setting on a Scandinavia. It's not specifically one country or place, but I did pick root words from the Scandinavian words and some Scandinavian names to, to create the make them up. And so Mary isn't actually not a Scandinavian name. That's the main character in Princess Academy. I just liked it. So sometimes I just do that too. You're a writer. You're allowed. All right. Yeah. Don't tell. That's a, that's a great thing about writing fantasy. Right. Those poor historical fiction writers. It's a lot more work. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you for being here with us tonight. We're really grateful you were here. We hope that you had as much fun as I did. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's so great to see your faces. I'm so alone and isolated. <laughs> it's nice to see people. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.